Thank you so much, Mari Uusitalo, for the interpretation of Claude Debussy's Syrinx. An unforgettable way to start and give voice to the Baltic Sea, accompanied by the pictures of Pekka Tuuri. Welcome to John Nurminen Foundation's Baltic Sea Talks. My name is Anna-Mari arrakoski Engard. I am the CEO of John Nurminen Foundation and will be your guide the next one and a half hours in the shallow waters of the Baltic Sea. With the Baltic Sea talks, we want to link our only sea in the northern Europe to the chain of ocean conservation that is driven by the climate change. With this unique series, the Baltic Sea Talks, we are focusing on the Baltic Sea from different angles within a larger societal discussion. The war in Ukraine has forced us to prioritize our needs and values. Our hearts are there. It has influenced our everyday life all over the Europe. We must face this challenge and use our strong collaboration also in the environmental work. The climate crisis affects the Baltic Sea through various mechanisms and makes its biggest problem, the eutrophication, even worse. We see this during the summers in form of blue-green algae. And this means even greater threat to the marine biodiversity. And still, we have accomplished great results in saving the sea, foremost in the Gulf of Finland. But as the IPC's latest report says, consumption of meat and energy should be reduced so that we somehow reach the set goals. Our diet has an impact to the state of the Baltic Sea too. All in all, despite the war, we should move on with the green transformation, transformation. I would say even blue transformation. Let's not forget the seas. The Baltic Sea talks is also our very concrete way to celebrate our 30th anniversary year, whereby our goal has not changed. We are here to save the Baltic Sea and its heritage for the future generations. Today, we have the second of a kind, Itameri Puhu, the Baltic Sea talks. And the first one in English, we have speakers from different countries around the Baltic Sea. Today, our topic is across the sea, beneath the surface. While planning this event, we did not know how topical this theme would become. How can we all, all nine states around the Baltic Sea, work for our common goal? Can we afford to forget the sea because of the war in Ukraine and a tense geopolitical situation in the Baltic Sea area? How do we keep the discussion space open despite the sanctions? Once again, the Baltic Sea is in the center of political curiosity. And today we'll discuss what does it mean to ecology of the sea, political cooperation, and research community. Dear audience, I would like to introduce to you uh, our keynote speaker from Stockholm, author, freelance journalist, former Minister of Environment and Climate, Isabella Levine. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much, Anna-Marie, and uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to speak at this uh, uh, seminar. And I'd also like to say congratulations so much to uh, Nurminen Foundation to the 30th anniversary. 
and it's a real, uh, I think, uh, very suitable time to have these discussions. Um, oops, there we go. We'll try to get back to that. So let me start just with uh, this famous picture. It was taken by the crew uh, going to um, the moon in 1972. It's called uh, the Blue Marble. And I think this was also a moment in, in, uh, in history when mankind saw the Earth from the outside, where we, for the first time, really realized that we're living on a blue planet, a planet of water. And the sea is really, it seems to be infinite. It covers 71% of our planet's surface. It's uh, 1.37 billion cubic kilometers of water that covers our Earth. On average, it's 4,000 meters deep. And all of us have this instinctive feeling that you could actually throw away anything in the ocean and it would disappear. And you could take out anything from the ocean and it would just magically replenish itself because it's so huge, it's so big, it's infinite. And this was actually also, for a very long time, the view of many scientists. So if we go back to 1883, the leading fisheries biologist of that time, his name was Thomas Huxley, and he just once famously said, when there was a concern, people were worried that the new modern uh, techniques of fishing with the utter trawl, the bottom trawl and all that technique, that that would threaten the fish. And he said with all his authority as a fisheries biologist, and I quote, I believe that the cod fishery and probably all the great sea fisheries are inexhaustible. That is to say that nothing we do seriously affects the number of fish, and any attempt to regulate the fisheries seems to be useless. Now we know that he was wrong. 90% of all the fish stocks around the world are uh, either overfished or fished to the brink of what could be called overfished what we today call fully exploited. And we also know that the things that we throw into the ocean, they do not disappear. We find microplastics at the deepest point of our ocean, at 11,000 meters at the Mariana Trench, you can find even plastic bags. You find microplastic in the Arctic's pristine uh, ice sheet where absolutely no human has ever been, you find microplastics. You find mi microplastics in the stomachs of tiny, tiny zooplankton, and you even find it in human blood, the recent study shows. And the uh, chemicals that we have emitted, we find PCB and dioxin in animals uh, even long, long after we have stopped emitting these uh, dangerous uh, substances into the air or into the water. And acidity. Well, our ocean has uh, become 30% more acidic in the last 100 years since we started emitting CO2 in the atmosphere because our ocean is absorbing the CO2, but it's not disappearing. It's still there, and the acidity is really going uh, increasing by the day. And the heat that we produce, we should really thank our ocean because it's absorbing the heat as well. If we didn't have the ocean to cool this planet off, then we would already been boiled, I'll tell you. But we can't be boiled because we don't have any water. We will be fried, <laughs> let me put it that way. So, okay, so... Why is it important what we're doing to the ocean? This is a real small reminder of what is, what, what, what is our ocean? What is it doing? It's not just sitting there and producing fish and swallowing all kinds of trash. No. It's the primary climate regulator. And through its kind of, you see the red and the blue lines there. That's our blue bloodstream. That's 
uh, how uh, the water is constantly being transported around our globe. It's called the thermohaline conveyor belt. And it's interconnected and it moves around our globe all the time uh, through the differences in temperature, in salinity, uh, by the winds, and also by the, the, the effect uh, of our own planet when it spins around, this, in, around its own axe called the Coriolis uh, effect. And every second, an amount of water is going from the warm surface water down to the bottom, kind of the, the motor of the whole uh, conveyor belt. Uh, the amount is corresponding to 5,000 Niagara Falls. Can you imagine 5,000 Niagara Falls at the uh, Arctic and Antarctic uh, convection areas? And it's going down and then it's going around our globe. And what does it do? It transports nutrients, it transports energy, oxygen, and this is what's really keeping this planet alive, us alive, because without water, there wouldn't be any life on this planet. So this is quite overwhelming, isn't it? We think, wow, all this water that is keeping our planet alive, wow, how much is it really? Well, if you gather to all the water on the planet together in one bubble, and you put it beside our planet, Earth, how big would it be? Huge, right? This is it. This is all of the Earth's water. It's the oceans, it's the ice caps, it's the glaciers, it's the lakes, it's the rivers, it's the groundwater, it's the clouds, it's, it's the water in the atmosphere. It's this. It's the water in our bodies, in our tears. It's all the water. It's all there. The diameter is 1,380 kilometers. That's about the distance from here to Bergen uh, in uh, western Norway. And you may find that hard to believe that it's so tiny, and I do as well, but uh, it's, um, the illustration is from the US Geological Service. And you, you might think that, well, wow, the Baltic Sea is bigger than that almost, it's as big. Well, if you look at the map, it's, it's quite big, blue dot, but it's only 56 meter on average depth in the Baltic Sea. And this bubble here is 1,380 kilometers high and wide in diameter. In diameter. So even, you know, that's small, but Baltic Sea is tiny. It's so small. The amount of water that we have is very, very vulnerable. You can compare it also with the Mediterranean Sea. The average in the Baltic is 56 meters. In, in the Mediterranean, it's 1,500 meters. So our brackish sea is really very, very vulnerable. And that is my first message to this audience. I have three messages. The, the first one I already made, that we have a very, very vulnerable ocean and that we depend on it. Uh, and we need it because our lives depend on it. And the second message is this. We must be aware of shifting baselines. We have gotten used to this Baltic Sea, to regular algal blooms, excessive nutrients, dead sea floors, overfished, it's polluted. The concept of shifting baselines, I think, was developed by a Canadian fisheries biologist. His name is Daniel Pauly. And he uh, kind of lift this up that we very uh, quickly, as humans, can get used to a new situation. And we find that at, as the normal baseline. And we forget what it used to be like in 20 years ago, or even two years ago, or not to speak about 100 years ago. So today we see a lot of this starving cod that comes out uh, from the Baltic Sea and in our fishermen's nets. But 100 years ago, maybe this would have been a normal catch 
This is not from the Baltic Sea, it's from uh, the North Sea, as you can see from England, but I would guess that you would see similar pictures from Finland or from, from Sweden one uh, a normal day when you had a good catch of cod. At least the cod were that big, they were not that starving as we see today. Now the um, state of the Baltic a hundred years ago is very hard for us to imagine. It was less eutrophied. Uh, in that sense it was also, of course, maybe less productive, but it still had a lot more cod a lot more uh, herring and seals than today, and, and other species. We forgot about the Baltic sturgeon, but we actually had the sturgeon in the Baltic Sea. And when we look at cod landings, cod catches, between the years 2004 and 2019, well, 19, it all stopped, as you know. We don't have any more cod catches because we have to have a moratorium on uh, fisheries because the cod has practically collapsed. But when you look at this, then you might think, wow, look back in 2006, that was a great year. 50,000 tons of cod was fished in that year. Uh, sounds like a good one. Um, we should get back to that. Well, this, if you look a little bit further back, you can see these catches in the, in the Baltic Sea. Now, 50,000 tons is maybe, <laughs> is nothing as compared to in 1985, there was almost 400,000 tons caught here in the Baltic Sea. But maybe that was too much. I think that was too much. I'm quite convinced it was. But look back in 1965, then 150,000 tons were caught. Three times as much as in 2006. Maybe that's the so-called carrying capacity, the capacity, the real capacity of the Baltic cod fisheries. My third message is that we should not be too nearsighted. We need to stop looking at the Baltic Sea with a microscope, trying to figure out, for instance, how many seals or how many cormorants or how many cod are still around and what is sustainable for each of these species. We need to zoom out and we need to see the Baltic Sea a little bit more from above and see the catchment areas. And the Baltic Sea catchment area is 20% of the European continent. 85 million people live uh, around the Baltic Sea uh, area, catchment area. It's in 14 countries. And the sources of pollution comes not only from rivers or land, but also from the air. And the threats are to our DRC are also multiplying with climate change. So we, not, we don't only have pollution and eutrophication and overfishing to worry about. We also need to worry about warming, acidification, uh, that it, more and more fresh water comes into our Baltic brackish sea, new alien species are moving in, and the risk of ecosystem flips, will, which will change our sea totally and fundamentally. So while we are counting fish and seals, the whole sea is changing. And I believe that we need to have a holistic view and introduce ocean targets in all relevant policy areas, the same way that we are doing on climate. So what is needed? I think we need a new holistic view on ocean policies. In Sweden, a cross-party parliamentary committee has recently done very valuable work trying to think together, cross-party, it's across the Swedish parliament, what could be a real game-changer for our ocean? And they came up with more than 100 suggestions. And um, you can see the two volumes of the committee's work here. But I'm just going to mention one major recommendation that came up from the Parliamentary Committee's work, and this is it. To introduce an overarching ocean law comparable with a climate law that we have in Sweden, you also have it in Finland, we now have it also on a European level. And we need a, a, a similar ocean law, both at EU levels and at national levels. So what would be the difference for, with what we already have? Well, it's making it binding in law. That's the difference. 
because we have had targets for a very long time and it's the, 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 the needed change that is, uh, is coming much, much uh, too slow. So with um, legislation, you make it a priority for legislation, le legislators, not something that always can come in last and be forgotten. Goals and targets have to be uh, fulfilled. Uh, and we know that by only setting goals, that's not enough. So this is uh, what I want to propose to you all uh, to consider uh, how we can really step up the importance and the priority of ocean recovery and especially of our vulnerable Baltic Sea and how we can do it together. Finally, this is the choice that we have. If we continue as before, maybe this will be the future for our children or if we really have a new serious approach from source to sea across all sectors, we will hopefully have this future for our children and for our dear Baltic Sea. Thank you very much for listening. Isabella, um, could you elaborate a little bit that uh, from source to sea you mentioned? right in the end yes. and i totally agree this is the this is uh the target we also have in mind but from source to, source to sea what do you have in mind well i think um, that all activities on land we know that we saw the kind of the, the big uh, ocean basin that that is affecting the baltic sea and so many of the activities uh, kind of end up in the baltic sea either by air pollution or by uh, emissions from, from, from land. Yeah. So we need really to make sure that all the activities that are uh, impacting the Baltic Sea, that they have uh, real restrictions and targets to work towards to, make, to, to contribute to the recovery of the Baltic Sea. And uh, that could be kind of, I mean, it's all from the industry side uh, when it comes to, of course, climate targets, and they are interconnected with, uh, with uh, the threats uh, of the Baltic Sea and of the ocean as a whole. Mm -hmm. But it can also be um, chemicals, pharmaceuticals, all of that. And um, I, I think there's a lot that could be done if we try to, to really prevent anything from coming out in, uh, in as pollution uh, before it happens, instead of kind of being uh, really confronted with, uh, with the problem with the when it's too late. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I like the idea of ocean law. What do you think? How can we, how can we make it happen? Uh, how can we lobby for it? Well, I think, first of all, it's, it's an idea that came up. I didn't come up with this idea. I think was, I was really so happy when yeah. <laughs> I received uh, that parliamentary committee's work uh, when I was still a minister. Uh, unfortunately, my uh, predecessor, he, she hasn't kind of uh, put this forward yet. I hope that it will happen. Um, but it has to go, uh, the idea has to come to, well, let's say the Finnish parliament. Mm -hmm. And I know that the commission is also interested, the EU commission, uh, to, to set this on a European level. And I think that would also be uh, splendid. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, and really helpful. I think we all would agree that we need also legislation on, on, uh, to help us in our private deeds, but also on, on the business level as well as um, in the state level. Last question. You write and talk a lot about fish, and I know that you have uh, you kind of do dove into the cod uh, issue, as, as we heard. You are very into that. Do you fish yourself? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. So it will be only the future generations doing it. <laughs> well, li listen, I, one of my kind of... Yes, I, I, I did fish... I think it was 19, when I was like uh, eight, nine years old, my father took me to Åland uh, and he rented a cottage there. So we spent the whole summer there. And it was kind of, uh, it was the summer uh, of Jedda, how do you say oh. that in English? Uh, pike, pike, yes. It thanks. was the pike, uh, pike, uh, kind of <laughs> peak. The Pike Peak uh, year, there was so uh, many uh, pikes. So 
each time I kind of, I was eight, nine years old, and each time I just, uh, yeah, I let the, the, the hook out, and a uh, pike <laughs> <laughs> immediately came, and I couldn't kill it, you know, okay. I was, you know, uh, so my father had to kill it all the time. So I'm, I'm a little bit um, sensitive about killing <laughs> animals, so <laughs> that's, that's my problem, but I like to be out in the nature, and I, I really... I mean, it's wonderful to see that when it's so much life in, in the ocean. That's right. Mm. Thanks a lot. Please have a seat. Thank you. Uh, now would I, I would like to introduce to you all our other panelists. Um, Professor Alf Norko, scientific leader of uh, Tvärmin Zoological Station of the University of Helsinki. Which way do you want to? <laughs> Please. Thank you. Thank you. Take and Admiral Juhani Kaskiala, former commander of the Finnish Defence Forces. And, just, and Dr. Lilian Busse, the chairman of HELCOM, is unfortunately not able to attend due to the restrictions of COVID-19. We do live in, in these times. We all have agreed to uh, discuss on first name basis. We all have long and complicated names and titles, so this is the easiest way for all of us. So, <coughs> dear friends, how does the Baltic Sea talk to you today? Alf, if, let's have a just kind of a well, warm up round. <laughs> let's put it that way that we had some hopes for spring. And, um, and, and this morning we had massive snowfall and, and our researchers, our re young researchers went out diving yes. this morning at Tvärvene, uh, where I work. And um, it was kind of a, a sense of change going on um, where you don't really know if it's going in the better direction or in the worst direction. But today it was a bit of a disappointment, but the work, work kind of goes on. So I guess that's my sentiment from... <laughs> Okay. from this morning. <laughs> Very good. Very good greetings. How about you, Isabella? How does it talk to you? Well, I just uh, came here by boat, actually, from Stockholm, so it spoke to me all night. <laughs> <laughs> Was it uh, in, a in a pleasant way. No, I mean, the weather could be better, but uh, it, it really got me into the right mood of talking about the Baltic Sea today and uh, really going to sleep with all the waves like that, you get in contact with it. Great. And I live by the sea as well, so I, I'm, I see it every day. Great. And how about you, Johanny? I took a walk uh, to Taivalahti to see the <coughs> sea. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I could see, uh, still see some, some ice there, but uh, I recalled that 1969, when I, was, I graduated from the Naval Academy, uh, which is in Suomelin, Sveabori, we took the bus on the ice to, to Helsinki on this very day. Uh, when the graduation took place and, and so the bus connection was still there and uh, it more or less was every winter when I stayed in, in the Naval Academy. So those days are gone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's right, though if you look out the window this morning we had the heavy snowfall here in Helsinki so we mm -hmm. have at least still the four, four seasons. Well, uh, talking about today and talking about um, the media or the news today, it seems that we all managed to deal with only one topic at a time. It, for the last two years, it was nearly all the time to COVID-19, and now it is the war in Ukraine. When it's the time for the oceans, how can we at these times uh, put the, the oceans and the ocean conservation as a, as a center of the discussion and attention. What do you say? Well, I think we, I think we need to keep it um, on the agenda all the time, regardless of what's going on, because we can't afford anything else. Um, I think, as Isabella pointed out in her really nice um, summary, um, we're living at, at, the, you know, at the crossroads now in terms mm -hmm. of our ocean ecosystems and, and the situation of the Baltic is moving even faster than our global oceans. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so we need to kind of keep that work going. And of course, it's, it's complicated when there's um, interruptions with other issues, but, mm -hmm. but nevertheless. Yeah. 
And it's so, so not supposed mm. to be a kind of a either or. Yes, we know mm. that co uh, work needs to be continued. How do you see that, Johanny, in the in, in the middle of uh, kind of a defense or uh, talking about security, security mm. and and war? Well, I fully agree what Alf said. These are parallel issues, and and uh, we we can't lose the the focus mm -hmm. on on the environment, but. These sad events which are taking place in, in Ukraine today, I was reminded actually about geography when, uh, when I saw uh, Isabella's uh, pictures there. Today we are actually east of Lviv, which is the yes. capital of the eastern mm. Ukraine, uh, which is, uh, I think longitude-wise, we are 25, 25th uh, uh, east and, and they are 24 there. So it's so close to us, mm. mm -hmm. and uh, we are actually in the same catchment area. Yes. Mm. So when Isabella said from sources mm. to ocean, mm. I hope that we are not going to see, this is a very grim picture, that we are not going to see blood coming to, mm. to Baltic Sea when uh, the same catchment area is there. And, and from that source, the war, uh, the implications are, of course, very awful. Mm. But uh, I. I think we have to solve this problem, um, but it doesn't disturb our, our efforts to and aspirations what comes to, to the Baltic Sea. Yes. Mm. Now when you mentioned this grim picture, I, I have to stay there a little while and, and, and uh, change the color, though. Um, we have also been discuss discussing in our foundation about the situation, does, uh, does the war affect the state of the Baltic Sea? And now looking at you, Alf, uh, and, and uh, learning about the, uh, the um, oil and gas business, which are the huge, uh, huge business areas for Ukraine. Uh, would there be any danger uh, that the, the state of our poor sea will get even worse because of the war? Do you think? I, well, I, I, I would think that the risk with the marine traffic is maybe the, bigger. The, the really big ones, and I can't really judge that I think Johanny or Isabel are better placed to, to comment on that. But I, I, apart from that, we're so seeing so many changes going on that are not single but multiple um, that relate to uh, the regional drivers mm -hmm. of, and that might be food production and how yeah. that might be changing. Um, but then we have the global drivers on top of that and, and their interaction with all the other pressures are, are kind of unpredictable. but. Um, so, yeah, I, I couldn't really say. But I would say that, I mean, immediate catastrophic events related to marine traffic are perhaps the... the more, more probable. Yeah, more yeah. probable, maybe. I don't know. Do you want to add to that? No, uh, well, I, I, I hope... I'm not certain that it will play out that way, but, I mean, I hope that this terrible, terrible situation can result in us uh, getting rid of our dependency on fossil fuels a little bit mm. quicker. Because I think people now are realizing that a lot of that fossil fuel is coming from Russia and it's financing the war, it's financing the, the, the power of Putin. Mm. And a lot of people uh, finally may think that it's worth paying the price of kind of doing the transition in order to get away from that. I mean, we had a situation uh, last week in Sweden where we had this big oil, <laughs> oil <laughs> tanker coming into a Swedish port, rusty one, uh, and the port uh, workers said, "Well, we're not going to we're not going to take this in because it's it's Russian," mm -hmm. and 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 it, it's the uh, the goal. Uh, I mean. Uh, the oil from the tanker was going to Arlanda Airport to fuel the, <laughs> the air traffic in Sweden. Okay. And, you know, it's, it's yeah. all interconnected with yeah. Russia, the oil, yeah. our, the way of life, people going back and forth to New York to do some shopping and think, uh, this is very clean and you have all the perfume in the air and everything is so glamorous. It's not glamorous. It's, I mean, <laughs> we're, we're destroying this planet. I mean, we're, we're kind of getting uh, oil from, from the Arctic, where indigenous people are being pushed away. I mean, it's not 
beautiful at all, and we think that it is. And we have these fancy cars, and they're all new, and you have the special perfume in the cars as well, <laughs> because they're new. I mean, we have to look behind that, and I think maybe this, this opens a little bit up the yeah. curtain, mm. where we see that, okay, so maybe we can take a little bit of sacrifice for a little time in order to make the transition. Um, that that's that would be really a uh, hope. That's right. Uh, I see there also a, a great challenge, and I was very happy to to read about the uh, IPCC's report, uh, kind of encouraging us all not to not to only think about what we are giving up, but what we are gaining by yes. changing at least those bits we all can do. And there have been great innovations and also great big steps done, and that should not be forgotten either. But I, I also see that this is, should be that uh, kind of a big pu push into the political decision making regarding the uh, fossil fuels towards the green. Mm -hmm. you well, I, I think uh, very much the same as uh, Alf and Isabella said, that, that at least in the, in the short term we see actually uh, uh, Decreasing uh, sort of volumes in trade, uh, we see that in, in really shipping in, in, in the Baltic Sea area. We see really the, uh, the uh, fossil fuels, I mean, the, the, uh, you name it, I mean, the, uh, how do you call the, the second pipeline? No, uh, Nord Stream 2. Nord Stream 2 was, was cancelled more mm -hmm. or less, and, and so that. Uh, decreases the, the volumes of the, uh, the gas. We, we see uh, oil exports from Russia uh, decreasing in volumes. So, uh, and actually the, the war events themselves do not affect the Baltic Sea area at the moment. Uh, there are many plans to, to really to prevent the potential escalations. I'm, I'm a member of the European Leadership Network. We are discussing I belong to a NATO Russia group, being non-NATO, non-Russia. Mm. And, and, uh, <laughs> but uh, discussing there how to prevent or how to reduce the risks of unintended uh, incidents, yes. which took place in the, in the Cold War period. And today we see much more calm. There were years, a few years ago, when there were these incidents close by, uh, caused by, by aircraft and, 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 and ships. Uh, but, uh, but we are really doing our best efforts to, to come back to the Cold War regulation and rules. There were international rules how to behave, what were the minimum distances between ships and, and aircraft. But uh, with the end of the Cold War, they, they were disposed of. So uh, at the moment, I don't really see a threat from mm -hmm. the war itself to the Baltic Sea or the events there. Uh, and the reduced shipping uh, might might be uh, sort of a counter uh, counterwise uh, effect. Yeah. Actually, Mr. Putin is doing his best to to reach uh, his goals counterproductive way. So, uniting Europe, uniting mm -hmm. transatlantic relations, mm -hmm. or, or Europe and, and and getting Finland and Sweden in NATO, and 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 really, uh, there are many many issues where. And, and really the fossil fuels, yes. uh, uh, not the least of them. Mm. That's right. Yeah, Isabella, please. Uh, well, I mean, um, maybe Alf can confirm this, but uh, as I understand, after the Second World War, you know, this is not why we should have wars, but the fish populations grew very much mm. <laughs> because it was too dangerous to go out fishing for a number of years. So after the Second World War, there was kind of a bounty of, of, of fish in the North Sea, and um, the same thing uh, yeah, outside right. the, the Horn of Africa when, mm -hmm. when uh, Somalia collapsed, and uh, then mm -hmm. no one dared to go there and fish anymore. And all of a sudden, you are talking about shifting baselines, so like mm -hmm. after 10 years or so, yeah. the fish started coming into Kenyan waters uh, from Somalian waters. And they've never seen so big fish, <laughs> but that was because the the, the sea started to kind of uh, rebuild uh, uh, to a more um, virgin or pristine uh, state. So war can have uh, different impacts on the ocean and on the environment, but I think 
um, what we need to focus on is to kind of take humanity to the next stage of consciousness so that we don't act this mm. totally dis self-destructive way that mm -hmm. we see is going on now, both when it comes to the war, but also how we're destroying our planet. Mm. Yes. Could I ask yes. a question about your, uh, your one of your crafts showed, was it 380,000 catches of, of, of tons of, yes. of cod, 1985? Yes. I was just wondering, well, that can't be sort of a, I mean, going down there, couldn't be overfishing. Uh, there has to be some other reasons because they really, you you Alf really can't uh, uh, can't do that. Because I remember 1985, I went to the squ market square in in Helsinki, bought cod, and it was overwhelmingly and all yeah. the tables there. You could actually, with a bare uh, uh, crook, you could catch as many as yeah. you wished yeah. without any any bait there. Uh, so there has to be other reasons as well. Mm. Yeah, of course, it also relates to the status of the Baltic, where mm -hmm. we have um, immense areas that have been eutrophied for a long time and mm. where we have hypoxic areas, so mm. oxygen deficient areas. And, and of course, the cod is also dependent on, on being able to reproduce um, mm. at certain um, the salt levels, mm -hmm. and, and that salt level, the salinity, um, is, is kind of coincides with areas that, that then have also become um, oxygen deficient. And this is, of course, mm. affecting kind of the, the potential of the cod reproduction and the abundance of cod that we might have. Right. Yeah. Um, but of course, we had had uh, oxygen deficiency before that as well. So mm -hmm. some of these are populations that, that might have an exceptionally good year of reproduction and then it, it shows for quite a long time mm -hmm. and then you get the fisheries mm -hmm. catches. But but it's very clear that, that the fishery in itself has been overexploiting mm -hmm. uh, the fish, especially considering um, the other problems the fish have. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of the thing that, you know, yeah. because we have these multiple pressures, we need to reduce mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. ones we can. Yeah, manage. but it, it would be interesting to know. I mm -hmm. mean, there were some huge uh, uh, year classes back yeah. in the 80s, yeah. and they fished them all up. Yeah. But a fish can become, what, 30, 40 years old? That's right. Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. if you had kept some of the fish in mm. the Baltic back then and kind of fished a, at a mm. more sustainable level, mm. what would you say? What would that be? A, uh, well, I, realistic way of, of, of putting I, I don't know if we have a particularly good history of actually managing the fisheries in the Baltic. Mm. Um, and so, uh, I mean, in the best case scenario, yes, um, mm. that would be the, would be kind of the aim, but, but whether it actually would have happened, I'm not sure. Mm. Yeah. You mentioned Alf eutrophication and uh, some, some of the other problems of, of uh, the Baltic Sea and uh, taking Isabella space and shifting the baseline, what big things could we do really to stop the eutrophication and kind of use this, uh, this moment uh, to, to, of this unification and a strong collaboration uh, uh, towards to, to really a better state of the Baltic Sea? Do you have any remedy for that? You ask all. I ask mm. all yeah, of you. Okay, okay. <laughs> Um, well, we've, we've been fighting um, eutrophication in particular as, you know, it has been identified as the, as the, the major problem perhaps yes. um, associated with many, many more, but we've been fighting it for a long time and I would say that it has not been in vain. Um, there's been significant improvements where actually, you know, uh, work has been done and I think I think the work in particular by, by Helcom as coordinators and, and, mm. and you know, that has taken us in the right direction. Um, but we're still fighting it. And it, it's, um, we have the legacy of all those nutrients in the sea that are already there and, and, and be circulating. And we can't expect recovery to happen uh, particularly fast. My colleagues in Stockholm, they've calculated that, that it can take between 50 and 200 years to recover, for mm. the ecosystems to recover. It's just that we don't have that patience mm -hmm. so we, um, um, to look at, to see that recovery. Uh, but at the same time, we need to have major um, 
uh, kind of system changes in our food production. Yes. And, and this relates to meat production. I mean, in Finland, I just read the other day as well that you know, about 60% of all our grain is going to meat production. Mm -hmm. um, as as fodder for for uh, meat production and 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 so we need to shorten those um, those kind of links there to to start actually eating um, eating differently and and looking after our um, our catchment in a different way mm. yeah. and and there's a huge amount of work still to be done and and it seems to me I mean I'm not an expert on 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 catchment measures but but it seems to me that there are really simple ways that things could be improved that are not being taken so mm. absolutely i totally agree but isabella uh, yeah i think we we, we of, at least i do t talk a lot about fisheries when talking about the ocean but uh of course agriculture mm -hmm. is uh at the center of eutrophication problem and it is a very conservative sector. And it's also a sector where politicians are very, very cautious to mm. kind of set strict measures that uh, could affect food prices, could affect uh, the, the, the production possibilities for, for our agriculture workers and, and, and farmers. And of course, it's a kind of an instinct that we should protect uh, food production and food security for, for the citizens. Um, but I think we need to rethink, as, exactly as you say, rethink the, the food systems. And we kind of need to <laughs> dare to take that discussion. And talking about Russia, I mean, 20% of all the, the, the phosphate minerals mm. in Europe comes from Russia, import mm -hmm. from Russia. Yeah. And the whole, uh, the, 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 the nutrients that go into food production uh, through uh, using fossil fuels, gas, and etc. And there are other ways of doing it. I read an article uh, just the other day about uh, using uh, bacteria that kind of works around uh, the the root threads <laughs> of a plant and and mm. we actually killed off those bacteria through uh, artificial um, nutrients in the soil but kind of revitalizing the soil we could actually get those bacteria mm. back yeah. working mm. but this this i mean i've been in politics for for 12 years and kind of it's People don't want to hear this because we're kind of into these production systems. But actually, then uh, with the eutrophication, it's all about that. Um, yes, and I must say that uh, I see and feel the point when it comes to politics. But I, we have seen in our in our concrete projects uh, at the Jon Nurminen Foundation here in Finland that the farmers are actually quite keen on. Uh, improving and, and, and doing sustainable uh, agriculture. So that seems not to be the problem. It's basically, okay. it's, mm. the, it's, the, it's on the system level, indeed, it's in, in mm. the politics. Mm. But la last but it's one. Still, this. It's really, uh, uh, I mean, very inefficient way to feed the people, to, to grow <laughs> the grain and, yeah. and give it to the cattle and, 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 and then add, add, add the bread meat. And I think the consumers are showing signs. Mm. Uh, I mean, the red meat uh, uh, consum con consumption is going down, and, and people are yeah. are appreciating other other ways of feed, feeding themselves. Uh, I just uh, uh, there's a we have a security of supply system where where in times of crisis the crisis may help here again. Uh, I don't want that to happen, but but at least in people's minds. We, we store grain and, mm. and seeds, but, but that's uh, in the times of crisis, you are not allowed to, to eat that much of meat. You, you have to, to stay or stick to, to the grain, and, mm. and, and, uh, and that's certainly because they are easier to, uh, to store and, and, and to, to deliver. Mm -hmm. to distribute. Mm -hmm. That's right, a good point. Mm. But we are not here to talk only on, uh, with ourselves. Uh, we have a I will now invite Helmi Suvisaari, the Baltic Sea ambassador from the Finnish Nature League, to, to ask a question to you. Mm. Please, Helmi. Oh, there you are. Hello. Uh, I work 
work with the children and youth of Baltic Sea, educating them about Baltic Sea and, and the future of it. So that is why my question to you is concerning the children and youth. And to our panel, my question is that how are the youth taken into consideration in Baltic Sea matters and is their voice being heard? What do you say? Is the voice being heard? Maybe, maybe I could start. I, I think that the, um, the next generation of, of kids and, and, um, uh, are exceptionally important. Mm. Um, people ask me sometimes, what is the single best thing you can do um, to save the Baltic? My standard answer is that we need to educate young people and, and to get them to appreciate the sea. Um, our Baltic, um, because that way they will kind of grow an inherent um, need to know more and, and in their own way contribute. And actually they were very efficient ambassadors for their parents as well in terms of kind of changing, <laughs> changing thoughts about um, how we treat our oceans. Um, so I think that's, that's a very, very important role they have. Um, we've been working with trying to also portray just like Picaturi's photos that are about showing that you know the Baltic is not dead. I think if we only talk about talk in despair about how the game is lost, um, then it's not very inspirational for mm. uh, for the next generation either. So I think we need to kind of demonstrate hope and show why we should care about it. And and so that's what we do from from a kind of a research and, and educational perspective, it's, it's really integral. Mm -hmm. yes. Well, if I continue, I mean, from, from a political perspective, I would say um, the voices of future generations are not heard enough. Mm. Absolutely not. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here sitting here with a climate crisis and an <laughs> ocean crisis and, and, and all of that. So it's very much about this generation, us now, next four years, that's the perspective that many politicians have, and I think that's why we're in this mess. Um, but um, I totally agree that knowledge is extremely important, and we made in, in Sweden uh, uh, some um, put some bu budget into so-called ocean literacy uh, so that young people should really learn about the, the ocean and uh, I, I totally agree that that is a very good uh, insurance that uh, future politicians will actually care more about the oceans when the, the voters do. But it's kind of interlinked um, and of course uh, that I think that's a, a kind of intrinsic problem in, in democracies that uh, the voices of those that are not yet born or those that cannot vote today are not mm -hmm. heard enough. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, really about the education. I just, uh, the other day I took my six-year-old grandson to, to, to the port and, and we saw the Tallinn uh, ferry leaving uh, Helsinki for, for Tallinn and, and how the the main engines were started, and you see it from the smoke, uh, from the stack, the smoke coming up. And, and and he asked me, why don't they have electric propulsion? Why mm. why there are not electric uh, ferries? And and I had to explain all that. And and uh, and of course, uh, once you start from the six-year-old and and you start educating them, you shouldn't actually copy anything today from Russia. I, I don't. It's it's not acceptable. Uh, but but when we visited Vodokanal, and and <laughs> uh, which is Saint Petersburg Waterworks, and saw their kindergarten uh, type uh, playground where they had all the educational programs and and how they uh, spoke about clean water and and uh, and the Baltic Sea. That was uh, something which we could take as an example. Mm -hmm. About the only example I can envisage at the moment. <laughs> Okay, I continue with that, uh, Johanny. Um, how can we keep the discussion space open in times of, of this? 
I mean, you mean about... I mean Russia, and I mean still we need all the Baltic Sea states really to work together at least at, at some point. In a way, uh, after the Cold War and when uh, after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, we came to uh, a more positive uh, geographic geopolitical situation. Uh, Russia is only in Kaliningrad, mm -hmm. and and then the eastern uh, eastern part of the Gulf of Finland. So they have a very short access and, and very, very uh, short, actually, shoreline, coastline uh, oh. towards the Baltic Sea. And when we extended our, uh, our uh, territorial uh, sea to 12 miles in all Baltic Sea states, the sovereignty of the nations, the, the coastal states, the little states, was extended to more to, towards the center of the, uh, of the Baltic Sea. So the... Uh, Today we have a very narrow corridor of international waters between Estonia and Finland, six miles according to, to the agreements. And, and so the sovereign states can extend their measures and, and their, their rights Nearly on their territorial waters and, and, and to, to, uh, to a greater extent than it used to be. Mm -hmm. So uh, in that sense we still have, uh, the governments have their powers and, and their rights. Mm. A very good point. So we don't have to hide behind this political, uh, mm. really tough situation. Would be an undermining of mm. the of the year, but uh, understatement of the year. But uh, we could really work uh, more nationally and, and actually yeah. internationally, even though not with all. Uh, and Helcom is and doing Helcom, well. Mm. Though uh, they have, as far as I understand, they have at the moment frozen the the work because mm. of the of the war in Ukraine. <clears throat> but how does it look uh, now? I would like really know: Is there a lot of traffic underneath? I mean, beneath the surface, and then a half after that, mm -hmm. how does it look like? What's the state? The, we, uh, I mean, in, during the Cold War, uh, there was much more than today. <laughs> okay. Because we had, uh, say, we had um, uh, surveillance systems. We had mm -hmm. acoustic and man magnetic surveillance systems. Even in the, uh, in the mouth of the Gulf of Finland, between Paldiski and Hangwe, uh, there were huge uh, sonar buoys, so sonars, which were floating between the surface and, and the, the sea uh, bottom. And, and all these equipments, of course, had to be anchored. There, there were cables. Of course, today we have cables and, and pipelines as well, uh, more in the international waters where they have the right to, to actually to insert them. Uh, so, uh, and then there were weapon systems. Mm -hmm. Sweden had a, a sort of a remote controlled mine fields uh, on, the, on the access of, of the fairways to Stockholm uh, and, uh, and uh, some other countries as well. So we had uh, our uh, hydrophone uh, systems in, in every major fairways towards, uh, towards uh, the ports. So there were lots of infrastructure uh, then. Yeah. Uh, many of them have, have actually vanished today because there are other systems. But you still have, uh, right, the Russians have, uh, they have uh, a, which, uh, which have been uh, tried, uh, not in the Baltic Sea area, but, but they have even uh, Poseidon type uh, sort of a, um, how do you call it, uh, unmanned uh, underwater vehicles, okay. which, uh, which, uh, which can be equipped with a major weapon system. So, so there are systems, but, but not to the extent as, as they were in the Cold War, when this was do sea dominated by the Soviet Union. Okay. And they had every system there, and, and we were facing the threat of their systems. So that's what we had defensive systems as well. So it's much more uh, peaceful today. Mm. Finally, some in good news. Sense. <laughs> <laughs> in that sense. <laughs> now, Al uh, Alf, uh, the, the state of the Baltic Sea, how does it look like underneath? Um, yeah, well, I think, I think one point is, of course, that the entire um, sea is connected. You know, the ocean currents connects us all. And um, so it's our joint, it truly is our joint waters mm -hmm. um, because they circulate. And, and I think I'm, I'm a bit spoiled because I work at the Hanko Peninsula where it's so well flashed that we don't really see the problems. Um, 
so well, but of course I, I, I work with the problems, so I know they're there. And um, when we go a bit deeper down uh, below the surface to places where only Rope and his colleagues in Badewanne <laughs> go diving, um, you know, that's, that's an anoxic, uh, terrible place um, where not a lot of higher life really can live. Yeah. Um, and, and that's out of sight, so it's, um, you know, we don't really think about it. But of course, those waters are connected with the surface. And, um, and um, so, I mean, we've seen uh, over so many years how, how these key um, underwater environments and some of our uh, iconic habitats like bladder rack mm -hmm. or blue mussels or seagrass beds, et cetera, mm -hmm. have been smothered by, by eutrophication and, 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 and such. So, so it is both beautiful and a bit sad. Um, but I think that, that what is happening now is actually a, a major concern. So we've, I work a lot with the, um, with the combined effects of, of biodiversity change and then how climate is influencing um, our coastal ecosystems in particular. Yeah. And, uh, and we're seeing really rapid changes going on. So um, we've been measuring temperature at the Tvarman Research Station since 1926, every 10th day apart from during the war and during the occupation, we um, staff have gone out and, and, and collected temperature data. And we see uh, over two and a half degree change since 1990 in our coastal waters. Mm -hmm. But it's not the average that is the problem necessarily. It's the, the variation mm -hmm. around the average that is the problem. And so in fact, um, when we think about the Baltic and the legacy of all those pressures we had, in particular eutrophication, when we then add the rising temperatures, we could kind of liken it with a COVID-sensitive patient that is, is then starting to get fever. Um, fever. And, and actually, in 2020, 75% of the time, uh, the Baltic had a fever. Hmm. So defined as a fever. So, mm -hmm. so then we can kind of all imagine that this is not a good situation to be in. Um, the point is, though, that these changes have been coming so fast. Yes. Um, and and so so that's what we're seeing. And this is this is um, unfortunately, for example, Finland, and neither does Sweden really have any sensitive or sensible um, follow-up on on biodiversity change in coastal waters. So even of our iconic environments like the bladder rack mm -hmm. or what have you, we don't really have we don't really have an idea so that we could even assess the changes mm. that are happening at the mm. moment. So, so I guess my message is that the context of what the Baltic has been, what it looks like today, and what its future will be, is kind of, all of that has been changing exceptionally fast. So, you know, we have new challenges, unfortunately. Now we have, uh, um, we have invited uh, the European Commissioner for the Environment, Oceans and Fisheries, Virginio Sinkevicius, uh, also to join us through video, and let's hear what he has to say and ask to you. Ladies and gentlemen, dear panelists, for several years now, the situation in the Baltic has been difficult, and it continues to deteriorate further. Unfortunately, today this applies not only to the environmental situation, but after Russia's invasion of Ukraine, it is equally true for the geopolitical situation. In reaction, the EU has suspended cooperation with Russia in the Baltic Marine Environment Protection Commission, HELCOM. I am fully aware of the challenges this possesses, but it is the only right thing to do under current circumstances. Turning specifically to fisheries, we have to note that the state of the Baltic fish stocks is so alarming that last year the Council of Ministers decided to close direct fisheries for three of ten stocks Eastern Cod, Western Cod and Western Herring for 2022. We also agreed on substantial quota reductions for other stocks, such as the Central Herring. This is a major disruption for the fishing industry and the related sectors. We know that the current situation is the result of several factors. Apart from the fishing pressure, there are also environmental factors which only made the situation worse, such as eutrophication and ammonia emissions, mostly from agriculture. The Nitrous Directive and the National Emissions Ceiling Directive have lowered nutrient losses from agriculture. 
but we urgently need to do more. All of this leaves us with the question, what more can we do? From my point of view, it's quite clear that the following four things need to be done. Firstly, together with the EU members, we need to step up our efforts to collectively decrease the main sources of pollution. Members have to implement fully the existing environmental legislation. For example, substantially decrease the level of nitrates in the sea and implement the guidelines on fertilizer use. I believe the member states are on their way of implementing the commitments made in our Baltic ministerial declaration of September 2020 and the measures set in HELCOM new action plan for the Baltic Sea of last year. Secondly, through the Restore Our Ocean and Waters mission, we are mobilizing science, technology and funds to address marine pollution in a systemic way. For this purpose, we have earmarked almost 350 million euros for the period of 2021 to 2023. Pollution concerns us all. So in the coming months, we will launch the mission charter. It will collect pledges and bring together member states, local authorities and stakeholders, such as the John Nurmian Foundation, around a common goal. Thirdly, it is absolutely necessary to maintain the appropriate fisheries management measures and allow the stocks enough time to recover and rebuild. If there is no fish, there can be no fishery. Fourthly, we must restructure our fishing fleets. It makes no sense to have fleets that are larger than the available fishing opportunities. And once the stocks have recovered, it will be very important to have a balanced fleet and not to increase the fishing pressure too quickly. Wishing you a fruitful discussion today, I would like to ask the panelists. What effect might the recent developments, in particular the suspension of cooperation with Russia in HELCOM and other international organizations and Russia breaching international environmental conventions, may have on the progress of addressing the Baltic Sea pollution? Assuming that you share my assessment of the situation, what would you recommend to improve the situation in the Baltic Sea? Thank you. Who would like to start? Uh, Isabella, please. Yeah, well, I, I could start. Well, I think the question about Russia, we shouldn't exaggerate that when it comes to the Baltic Sea. I mean, the EU is the main player here. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it's Finland, it's Poland, it's Sweden, it's Germany, it's, it's Denmark and so on. So we, we should just go on and do what we should do. And uh, I'm, I haven't been to mm -hmm. uh, that that playground with a, with a fantastic um, mm. pedagogic thing about the oceans in, in Russia. But I know, for instance, that Kaliningrad, uh, mm. um, how do you say, when uh, the, the, um, the wastewater, the wastewater uh, appliances there that even Sweden paid mm. for yes. with our <laughs> development aid was not finished mm. for a very, very long time. So Russia hasn't been a really active player, uh, in all, at least in, not in, in all the areas for, for a long time. So I think we should, we should do whatever, exactly what uh, the commissioner said uh, to uh, heighten the ambitions on all these areas. And I think the idea about an ocean law, mm -hmm. I think that is something that could also be developed. And when I was a minister, I also asked uh, um, our um, authority to look at the idea of asking ISIS of kind of doing a projection. I mean, what, what, ocean, what Baltic Sea are we heading for? And what, ocean, what Baltic Sea would we like to see? Mm. And then kind of we could do the backcasting of, okay, so if we want to see for our children uh, by 2100, this Baltic Sea with the productive uh, cod fisheries and herring fisheries and purposes and maybe some sturgeon and maybe we can even swim in it. And then what measures do we do, have to do now? And I think that would be a great idea for Helcom to kind of agree upon uh, to ask ISIS uh, some of these questions because now one of the, I think, really problems is that it's the, the whole management is so fragmented even if we have HELCOM, that's great. Mm -hmm. But we're looking at one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. And the, as everyone is pointing out, and what you said now about uh, the temperature, it's really alarming. And we need to 
uh, have, we need to use the precautionary approach. Yes. We cannot mm. have the maximum sustainable yield. What? Maximum? What? Mm. Why? Are you kidding me? We need to have the minimum sustainable yield. Mm. I mean, we can't go for maximum. We need to have security uh, kind of spaces uh, so that we... And, and now, herring, herring, the key species of the Baltic Sea, is under threat. We already have the cod collapsed. Mm. What happens when the herring collapses? Mm. Mm. We won't have any fish left. And what will happen to the water quality if we don't have the major actors in the ecosystem mm. even there? Yeah. I mean, it's unimaginable. And it's not science fiction, because mm. we know that, for instance, outside uh, uh, of, of Canada, where the cod collapsed in 1992, there's been a cod fishing moratorium now for more than 30 years, and the cod has not returned. Mm. And that's because the ecosystem has flipped, and once it has flipped, it's not going to go back just because you have a cod fishing moratorium, because all the species are interlinked. So we need to use the precautionary approach, and we need to have a kind of totally new uh, way of looking at, on, on, on how much can we as humans take out of this ocean. Yes, and take we care can, of We the can't take the maximum yeah, <laughs> And take care of the ecosystem and, and the biodiversity. Mm. And actually, I have a next question uh, for you, uh, uh, since I think Isabella answered to the commissioner's uh, question quite you know, in a bright way, uh, a good way, we could uh, jump into the biodiversity question um, and link to the uh, how how does how can we use uh, this discussion about oceans and economy and we use the Baltic Sea. Obviously, not only f fishermen use it, but we need it for the transportation and for many other th uh, things. Uh, we need the Baltic Sea in a good state and good health. We have one question to that, and I would now like to invite uh, Asta Soininen, Associate Sustainability and Regulations from Neste, to ask a question to you. Please, Asta. Yes, uh, you have been talking about transformation and future generations also, and Neste's purpose is also to create a healthier planet for, for the future children. Uh, uh, the Neste's transformation from a traditional oil company uh, to a global leader of renewables, renewable fuels and chemicals, is, is strongly, uh, owes strongly to, the, to our history in innovation and, and research, and 25% of our uh, personnel work in research. And uh, also, we uh, create new solutions for maritime um, uh, fuels for the six years old to have better <laughs> or more sustainable answers in the future as well. And uh, um, we have a brand new um, biodiversity vision when we want to have a um, uh, nature positive impact in our value chain in the future. So um, as, a, uh, as an industry um, representative, I, I would like to ask you how could uh, different industries increase collaboration in innovation, research and development to create solutions for uh, to decrease the pressure on biodiversity of the Baltic Sea. So how can the different industries collaborate together better in the future? Thank you, Asta. Who would like to start or answer? Now it's maybe, maybe I could, yes. I could try to answer. I, I'm not sure how it, uh, businesses need to do this, but I think that, that carrying um, responsibility uh, for a natural world should be the first priority because without that we don't just have the context for us humans to, to exist and I think the IPCC report really highlights this latest one that came out really highlights that if we want to restore or kind of adapt to what's coming um, biodiversity and human, like natural ecosystems are, are basically the foundation for all of that and, and they're intricately linked to, to, to us humans, and they're intricately linked to then the climate problem and, and climate emergency. And so, so I think the, uh, the main thing from a Baltic context that we can do is really, really promote um, protecting and, 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 and conservation of biodiversity and, and restoration um, um, to some extent, because um, that is that foundation we have. So. And this is not easy. It might seem trivial, and it might seem like, yeah, yeah, we're doing what we can. 
Uh, but really, I mean, and 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 in the Baltic, we don't really have any marine protected areas to talk about that really are effective. Um, the ones that are there are not placed in places where we know that the hotspots of biodiversity are. Our colleagues at the Finnish en Environment Institute have really elegantly showed that <clears throat> that um, you know the hotspots of biodiversity are are are, are on either in privately owned uh, waters or areas, etc. And and my point is that I think uh, the academic world, together with the decision makers, together with um, with businesses and industry, we need to kind of, we need to work for that same thing because without actually protecting or, or creating a better basis for the protection of biodiversity, the game is lost. So. Very good. And thank you for Asta for asking this because I think this is a good message. We really should use this, uh, this situation and this strong collaboration for a green transition or a blue transition. My dear panelists, how does the Baltic Sea talk to you now after our discussion? And what kind of message does it send to the Black Sea, perhaps? Black Sea? Yes, mm -hmm. we come back to the start. But how does it talk to you now? Maybe I could, I could start. I think that following on actually from the previous question, I think uh, what's going on in our oceans, um, globally and what's going on in the Baltic more regionally really highlights that we need to kind of do even harder work to to protect our oceans and and you know me as an academic I can't do that uh, <laughs> the decision makers mm. can try and do that uh, but the point is that we need the foundations we need the businesses we need mm -hmm. we need so many actors yes. um, to kind of work along kind of a joint mm -hmm. um, cause or yeah. for, for that joint cause. Yeah, mm -hmm. Johanny. I, I think what, um, what Isabella suggested about the ocean law mm -hmm. reminded me of the, the, the processes which can be really uh, tiresome, long, and, and uh, I mean, political uh, decision making is not that easy. And uh, once you make it international, it's, it's uh, even, even harder. Mm -hmm. uh, I just uh, happened to to have a look at the UN Convention for the Law of the Sea, which was actually signed 1982, which then uh, stipulated the territorial seas, etc., transit uh, passages, innocent passages. There were hundreds of of, of, of of points there, but it's amazingly big and sizable portion of the whole uh, Convention of the Law of the Sea is actually about uh, uh, the uh, fisheries, uh, the sea bottom and all that. It's not that uh, regulatory for, for maritime traffic or, or really the sovereignty of the nations, but it's really much of, many of the uh, points there are, are really, there are mammals, there are fisheries, there <laughs> are endless points. Uh, isn't that already a bit of an ocean law uh, which just had to have to be implemented, or do we have a, uh, a chance to to draw a new law just for 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 the Baltic Sea then? Mm. Mm. And to an extent, I would just say stop buying crude from Russia <laughs> <laughs> right away. Thank you, Slava Ukraini. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Johanny. Good, good point uh, mm. the, the, that there are already means. Uh, we can work with. Uh, Isabella, what, 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 how does it speak to you now after our discussion? Well, um, it's more like a COVID patient with a kind of a, <laughs> a, a very bad condition to start with, as you said. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that was a very striking image. Um, now the COVID is the climate change. Mm -hmm. and what it's, it's doing with temperature, what it's doing with acidity, acidification. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have an ocean, Baltic Sea, that is in a very, very bad state. About UNCLOS or the mm -hmm. UN law of the seas, uh, it's interesting because it's covering only 50%. Mm -hmm. uh, the 50% of the globe is outside national jurisdiction, mm -hmm. and it's still kind of True. the wild west <laughs> of yeah. the ocean. And there's negotiations going on right now on the preservation of biological diversity 
uh, in uh, areas beyond national jurisdiction. Mm. Mm. So it's taken that long to get there. 1957 and it's, on. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it's, it's, that's, but it's, it's true that there's a lot in UN Law of the Sea, and I was amazed when I saw it, but we're not, you know, mm. We're, mm. we're not implementing that. So we need something, uh, we, we need to have uh, set targets in time, uh, and we have need to have the measures, and we need to agree, agree on the measures. It's not only about the goals, we need to actually agree on the message, measures. And one, if we're going to say one positive thing, if I'm going to conclude with that, I mean, we've seen how kind of totally we have been able to transform our society, societies with the COVID pandemic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now we're seeing like unthinkable measures because we we see the 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 the, the atrocities in, in happening in Ukraine by Russia, so we have we yes. have the possibility to do these kind of drastic mm. measures, and we need to do drastic measures in order to save the Baltic Sea. Yes, we could do that. It's well, not impossible. Mm. Wonderful. <laughs> this, uh, I couldn't have uh, asked for better, better last words uh, if uh, even discussed earlier. I would thank you all, dear panelists, for your insights and all our performers uh, and dear colleagues at the Foundation. And most of all, dear audience, uh, since you made this day and you made it totally worthy of, of the Baltic Sea. And it, it is a wonderful way of celebrating both the sea as well as the anniversary of John Rubinian Foundation. Um, which reminds me, please, the last uh, uh, Baltic Sea talks of this year, anniversary year, will take place in the same place here in Big Finlandia early December this year. So hopefully see you then there. The stream, the live stream will end now, uh, but we here at the Big Finlandia can enjoy some finger food and drinks at the reception uh, after we have finished this Baltic Sea Talks with uh, yet another piece of art. I will now give the floor to Emma Salokoski and Johanna Juhola. Let's listen when the music mm -hmm. speaks on behalf of the sea again. Thank you, and we can 